Welcome, everybody. We're just getting started for today's session. Happy to have everybody joining us today. Uh, be letting people in as we get going. Uh, but today's session really focusing on, you know, athlete sponsorship, uh, you know, the opportunities and, and pitfalls for athlete sponsorship, especially looking now we're, you know, in the middle of the Olympics and seeing how all these athletes are going to fund the rest of their, their time or uh, leverage the activity they've had at the Olympics and where that can go moving forward. Uh, so really happy to have our speakers with us today. But before we get going, just to let you know, anytime during the session, uh, please drop questions into, into the chat uh, and we can insert those as we move through the conversation. Uh, and I wanna promote a couple uh, sessions we've got coming up. Uh, so over the next two months, we're gonna have a session on purpose sponsorship. Uh, we're also going to have a, a, a session on music sponsorship and music festivals. So really looking at the fact that the, the world is coming back to a lot of live events this summer. So we're we'll chatting about that. Uh, and then the third one we've got lined up is looking at how up and coming brands are utilizing sponsorship uh, and the, the different approach that they have versus some of the large brands. Uh, so more information will be coming out uh, over the next few weeks about those and happy to have you join that. Uh, but for today's session, we've got uh, Susan Ambrovich, from, who's a partner, head of entertainment and sport law with uh, Gallon WLG. We've also got Lyle Adams, who is the chief executive officer at Spry. I'm happy to have uh, Peter Constantino, who is the co-founder of Inspire Athlete Management and the president of uh, DEC Sports and Entertainment. Uh, so a, a range of... Uh, different inputs into sponsorship and the athlete space. Uh, happy to have the three of you here and I'll give you an opportunity to, to introduce yourselves and where you fit into the space. So Susan, do you want to jump in first? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Two years into the pandemic and I still forget to do that. Sorry. Thank you, Brad. Um, so again, I'm Susan Abramovich. I'm a partner at the law firm Galling WLG and I'm head of the entertainment and sports law group there. Um, so in that capacity, we represent both on the entertainment side and the sports side, every player, you know, possible player within the industry. So players, um, uh, teams, people who are brands sponsoring players or teams, um, and, and so on. Um, we also work on the entertainment side. So I'll be list tuning into your music festival uh, webinar as well. Um, and what we do is, you know, we handle the full range of legal services. In my practice, I do contracts and I help advise on business terms for things like endorsement contracts. Um, but we also have a full range of services. So if there's litigation issues, we've had some uh, litigation issues for athletes in terms of uh, appealing denials to be put onto the Olympic teams, for example. So we handle that kind of thing. Um, we have tax lawyers, corporate lawyers, and uh, IP lawyers. We also you know, take care of, people, you know, athletes and brands, IP, their trademarks, copyrights, if they have any, and so on. Great. Well, welcome. And, and Lyle, how about yourself? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Brad, for having me. Um, Lyle Adams, CEO of Spry. So Spry is a software company focused on making sure student athletes have the resources to successfully navigate uh, the new NIL era while making sure they're doing it in a compliant way. Um, you know, Peter and Susan, you know, you know, with their relationships, spend a lot of time with the brands, but you, as you, the brands navigate the space, they don't know what's allowed, what's not allowed. And the same can be said for student athletes, because there's a lot going on. So for us, we partner with the institutions to make sure that their student athletes can disclose in a compliant manner. So athletes can retain their eligibility, but also at the same time, we provide a lot of educational resources to empower them to navigate the space. Uh, not all athletes will have a professional representation, whether it's an agent or brand manager, uh, someone to help them to solicit and secure opportunities. So for us, it's more about, I'm sorry, we have a puppy at the house and she does not like neighbors, um, making sure that these student athletes have the resources to be successful as they now pursue their own opportunities. Um, but excited to be a part of the panelists and looking forward to today, today's conversation. Thanks, Lyle. And then Peter. Well, those are a couple of hard acts to follow. Uh, my name is Peter Cosentino, and as Brad mentioned, thanks for having us, by the way, Brad. This is great. It's, it looks like there's a great group of people on the call and looking forward to the next hour with everyone. Um, 
I kind of cut my teeth for the most part at the Blue Jays. I worked there for 11 seasons where it was really from the property side. And quite honestly, we worked mostly, I worked mostly on the consumer marketing side, but we would have companies come in and say they want to sponsor athletes. And sometimes they want to do a deal with the team. They just want to do a deal with the athlete. And so we, we learned really quickly how to navigate through and with the Players Association uh, and, and understanding what their needs were why they existed for the athletes um, and how the team and the, and, the, and the PA could coexist. And when I left the Jays, I decided that I wasn't going to work in the mass media sports, but I was going to work in really niche slash lifestyle um, aspects of sport, really kind of in the, in the world of market segmentation. So we focused for about 17 years, the first 17 years in action sports. And we worked with Canada Snowboard and Freestyle Canada. We did some work with Surf Canada um, and, um, and really, it was all about if you want if you want to reach youth in Q1, we'll put you into snowboarding. If you want to reach youth in the summer, we could put you into potentially skateboarding type of thing. Um, and now we we've, we've kind of morphed and moved over to the um, um, endurance side of things. So we work we do a lot of work with running Canada Running Series, all the marathons right across Canada. And uh, a partner, my partner Simon Williams and I, in Inspire Athlete Management during the pandemic when there were no events to sell sponsorship started uh, this athlete management business, which really focuses on cycling. Um, small, we've got eight, eight cyclists, but some of the some of Canada's best cyclists in the world. And really, again, identifying a segment for brands around which to tell their story. Great. Well, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of different areas for us to dive into here. And, you know, what, uh, It'll be interesting to see how much we can actually get through in an hour uh, because there's there's so many uh, different facets to it. And I, and I guess the starter I would have is and maybe great to start with you, Peter, is how is the approach for an athlete sponsorship different than you know a team or a league? Because they just don't have the, the same marketing power behind them. Yeah, they really do. Unless, unless you've got an incredible following. And really, that's where it starts. I mean, it, you are a brand just like the team's a brand. And you have to think of yourself as a brand. You have, to be, you have to be relevant. You have to provide esteem. You have to have a sense of differentiation. And really, like, tick all those boxes from, you know, brand health, if you will. Um, some do it better than others. And if you've got, um, you know, a lot of times it does coincide with performance. As performance goes up, Typically, your following goes up, your brand health goes up. And if you are prepared and ready to basically monetize that, to package that and get that out into the marketplace, you can do so. Um, a, a lot of, um, uh, quite honestly, a lot of agents will basically take a look at who's sponsoring the league and who's sponsoring the team. And there are some natural sponsorships that then can go to the athlete. Um, and then there are times when, you know, a challenger brand comes in and says, hey, no, listen, we don't sponsor the team. We don't sponsor the league, but we want you as an athlete, as a spokesperson. Um, so sometimes that's where the conflict arises between teams and athletes or leagues and athletes and who owns what. And it becomes, um, uh, can become a very tricky situation, although it's, it's very well and clearly laid out as to what you can own and what you can't own. So just getting back to it, it's just really about packaging yourself properly, using your performance as a marker to and really amplify what you're doing and then grow your following so that at the end of the day, the brand has actually something around which they can market. And, and do you find that the, you know, is it a, a mix of performance and the activity they're having on the, on the field or on the pitch? Uh, and then add on the influencer piece, or is the influencer marketing piece becoming much more of a focus? Um, they're definitely converging. Um, there's no question about it. it. You know, is an is an athlete uh, an influencer? Absolutely. You know, uh, I remember um, a while ago we did some work with the Canadian PGA, and we basically identified that your Canadian professional golfer at your club, your PGA professional at your club is a key influencer within that club. It's the, it's the kind of clubs he has, the kind of car he drives, the kind of watch he's got on his wrist. And everybody at the club says, I wanna swing like that guy. And so, you know, he's influencing the purchase behavior of the people at that club. And then when he goes and plays on the tour, um, you know, his, his, um, um, his reach is a lot bigger. So, you know, that said, there are influencers that have very kind of singular mediums like I'm on YouTube or I'm on TikTok and they're phenomenal and they've got incredible reach. 
I think what ath athletes do bring to the table, um, they've got that, plus they're performing, they're on broadcast, so they're on air, and uh, they get that extended reach that potentially an influencer who's just on YouTube, uh, in this case, doesn't have. Well, for sure. And then, you know, I think the, on the flip side, it's, you know, how do brands get into this? And I know, Susan, you were talking earlier that you, you represent brands as much as you represent athletes and, and uh, you know, entertainment individuals. Uh, do you help navigate the brand through their engagement or are you just getting in on the nuts and bolts of the contract? Well, we definitely start with the contract and help, you know, make sure that they're, they're hitting all the key points that they need to think about. And again, this is whether we represent the brand or we represent the athlete who's being who's sponsoring or, or doing the endorsement. But then as once the contract is put away and the endorsement starts happening, very often through the process, there are questions that come up. There's twists and turns that may have been anticipated by the contract, may not have been. And so, you know, we're always in the in the background um, sort of helping that process along. But the, the bulk of the work is up front, helping to, to advise on the deal terms and then drafting the contract. And then I guess, it, you know, I guess maybe from your experience on both sides, Peter, or I know Lyle, you, you've done quite a bit, but when brands are looking to engage and you've got the whole variety of, you know, league, team, athlete, uh, how are you doing the account management on that? And what kind of advice do you provide? We instruct, you know, we try to educate student athletes on like trying to align with brands that make most sense for them. Um, on the brand side, I think it's similar. I can say like, you know, you have larger brands that will be a bit more selective on what student athletes or athletes they choose to work for. Because, you know, as Peter can probably speak to shortly, the the nature of that relationship is unique and it kind of, it depends on the type of engagement, whether it's an activation, a sponsorship, like how they manage that is also uh, indicative of the overall relationship, but it also now factors in time. Um, a lot of things are shot out of season because in season athletes don't have a lot of time to, you know, dedicate, you know, an extra 10 to 12 hours a week on a filming or, you know, promotion. So they're trying to plan that stuff out there. I know some student athletes have, you know, hired brand managers to help them manage those expectations with some of their relationships. Others have tried to do it themselves, but I think the key is education and open communication to make sure that both parties are aware of what the responsibilities and, commitments are. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Lyle. I, I think, you know, that's why you'll even see, you know, Tiger Woods kind of set that bar way back when he said, I'm, you know, I'll have five, five sponsors. And so it does a couple things. It, it definitely elevates the price of, of entry to, you know, be a Tiger Woods sponsor. But secondly, it allows him to, he's got, he's only got five, you know, brands around which he's got a, you know, market as opposed to 25. And let's face it, he could have had 125 plus. Um, and at the end of the day, he wanted to be able to perform, you know, um, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, almost every week. And at the end of the day, that's their livelihood. That's how they get paid. But understanding that a lot of these athletes get paid a lot more in endorsements than they do even in prize money even in today's day and age. And to piggyback on that, the student athletes, the inverse of that though, uh, unfortunately, since there's no salary, their NIL earnings are some of their primary supplemental income. But at the same time, uh, unlike the big brands, there's a lot of performance tied. So it's like, you know, how do you educate the athlete to say, let me find a partner who's more um, interested in working with me as the individual than my performance, because performance fluctuates. If you look at the professional ranks, whether it's coaches or athletes, the bulk of salary is somewhat not tied to performance because it's too variable where they try to now have small add-ons, whether it's like winning the Stanley Cup or winning the Super Bowl. It's like you'll get a bonus for that, but that bonus in terms of what it means as a percentage of your contract is hopefully less than 10% if your agent did their, did their, did their homework, right? You don't want to have high variance of bonuses um, for things that you can't achieve. Whereas like how do you educate a student athlete on those things are very um, – it's challenging, and I think that's where a lot of athletes are trying to navigate now this new NIL world, right? Like, you know, you have, you don't have the experience or the historical precedent to take, hey, let me go look at what someone did 10 years ago, because NIL now is only eight months old. So these athletes are trying to figure it out on the go. So for us, education kind of helps them empower that, and then partnering with law firms or agencies who can come in and be subject matter experts to give them a bit more guidance. Because I was a soccer player. 
totally different world than a hockey player or a tennis player or a basketball player or an all-American football player. But at the same time, I can still make money in my locale or within my network. But how do you educate me on how to work with those people in my locale? Yeah, I think a big, a big issue is, you know, the knowledge base of the athlete uh, becomes, you know, pretty crucial for any brand coming in. It's what can they actually take on? What can they deliver on? Uh, and, you know, the spaces that they can play in. Because uh, when you're doing athlete management, uh, Peter, you know, do you, pro you know, provide a lot of time where you're coaching them on how to engage? You know, um, the younger ones, yes. And then the, the more, the, the, the people that have been in the athletes that have been in the game a little longer, you have to coach them a little bit less. Um, that said, you know, you're always giving them key points and conversation points um, things that they need to hit, um, in advance of, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. But for the most part, you know, for us, you know, listen, we're focused on cycling and so, and, but all the disciplines in cycling. So you understand that the road season, you know, literally they're at team camp now, and then they get into the spring classics and then they get to the, the Giro d'Italia and the, and the, and the Tour de France and the Vuelta of Spain and all that, and understanding how all that works um, knowing that they've got families, that they need downtime, that they've got to, you know, eat and sleep and all that kind of good stuff. So it's not about overwhelming them. It's getting the right sponsors for them at the right time um, and, and giving them manageable um, assets that they have to execute upon. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, because at the end of the day, no one wins um, at all. And so you want to make it a win-win for the athlete um, and the brand. You know, the brand's got to get some incredible value out of it, or they'll just go somewhere else. Yeah, and then, you know, Susan, are you finding you have to do a, a lot of coaching with the clients that you deal with on, on how to approach and, and where the engagements can play? Yeah, well, it depends on, the, again, the same things, level of sophistication of the client, how long they've been in the space, whether it's on the brand side or it's the athlete side. But, you know, typically we're running through and making sure they're hitting on all the key points and then figuring out how they want to deal with them. So in an endorsement agreement, you know, number one, what are the assets that, that can be used by the brand? You know, name, whether it's name, image, likeness, which photos, who consents, you know, is there approval rights, all of that, and, and how they can use them, what restrictions there might be. Then there's the, you know, what are the services, if any, to be rendered by, by the athlete to the brand? So how many social media posts? And it really gets granular, like this many social media posts on this social media platform. Are there live events? Are there, is there signed memorabilia or cards? Or So like, you know, the agreements really get down to that level. Um, there's, of course, uh, morals clauses, which hopefully we'll talk about later. I won't get in too deep into that now. But uh, that becomes a very important part of the agreement as well. Um, exclusivity is something that the, you know, somebody who hasn't done a lot of these may not realize, but the brands typically will want to have some exclusivity over the athlete, at least in, a, if not totally, over a category of, of goods and services that, they, that they're in the business of, of do, doing and, and, and selling. Um, so that's an important area to look at because that could restrict the athlete from earning their livelihood from other companies as well. You don't want to give too much exclusivity because it'll close you off to other endorsement possibilities. Then of course, compensation and how that works and the term and are there options to extend? Are there conditions for extending? So these are all the types of things that we run through in these agreements and we make sure they're covered or not depending on the side that we represent. And I imagine you have to layer in all the elements of, you know, what the league may have, what the team may have in terms of their agreements. Because I'm thinking about the Olympics right now, and I probably haven't seen, or very little have I seen of actual Olympic sponsors, but I can tell you the brand of every single snowboarder and every single uh, skier, because they've got that on full display. Uh, so they're trying to figure out, okay, what, what's permissible and what's not. A hundred percent. You definitely like what, if you know, you have to be careful not to grant the right to use to the sponsor uh, or the brand to use IP that you don't control. So for example, a team uniform typically would not be IP owned by the athlete themselves. So they have to be very careful before they, you know, say, okay, you can use this picture of me in my full on gear that shows the team, you know, logo. And I guess that kicks into you know the the different elements because you've now you've got 
you know, the, the actual athlete in their presence as an athlete, their influencer. And now you get into the whole market of NFTs. Uh, has that become a big, you know, well, Brad, a big Brad, addition to it? Quick point, though, to, to Susan's point, I don't know if everyone's been following what's happened at the Olympics with the snowboarder, right? She had a partnership with Prada that was approved early on, but then it was not approved going forward. So she's had to now pull out of the her snowboarding competitions because Prada was on the base of her snowboard. And for those who snowboard, like all the wax and stuff is very custom. So she couldn't now remove or cover the logo for obvious reasons. So she had to pull out. And it's a prime example of now some of the complexities that arise for Olympic sport athletes, right? Because um, some of the less, um, the sports with the less TV revenue, a lot of the Olympic sports, even like the Olympians in general, the Olympics is a really great time for them to earn a lot of supplemental compensation right? Because they're in the, they're, their spotlight and brand is the highest. So for her, sending that Prada deal on the snowboard was a wonderful thing for her, but she couldn't compete now at last minute. So it just shows how complex the Olympics are for some and the brands, whereas the professional, I would say the big five leagues in the United States, including MLS, the, P, the PA and the Players Associations have a lot more, um, they provide a lot more guidance to agents and athletes about what, what they can sell and cannot sell from a sponsorship and category standpoint. You know, uh, and that, that's such a great point because that's where representation really comes in. I mean, I, was, I would hazard to guess that Prada got even more uh, out of it by her not competing than they did if she actually finished in competing. Like that story just keeps going on and on and on. And uh, listen, there's always going to be athletes and agents that try to bend the rules. That rule is really in there for original equipment manufacturers. You know, does Prada really manufacture, you know, um, snowboards by volume? I I'm not so sure that they do. It doesn't mean that they, they won't. I'm sure it was a board that was produced somewhere and they, and, and, and they guised it as, you know, a Prada board. So it, listen, there's always going to be people that do that, but I think you can, you can, Avoid those situations if you have the right representation, good legal advice, understand where you sit, what you own, what you don't own, like Susan mentioned. Um, and then, and then you know, you're going to probably have a pretty fruitful uh, partnership. And are, are there elements that you need to include in every single piece of, you know, an agreement, uh, whether it's, you know, an athlete, and I guess, Susan, maybe it's entertainment is the same, uh, that just carries over that should be sort of the rote inclusions to make sure everyone's protected. Uh, yeah, well, I sort of hit on some of those deal points just before. Um, the other one, just going back to the um, what, you know, make sure you're only granting what you own. You know, there in every contract, there's always a reps and warranty section. And that's where it's, it says, okay, you're, you know, athlete is, you're telling brands that you can take this photo, use this photo of me in my team uniform. Well, you're repping and warranting that you actually have the rights that you're purporting to grant to me. And if that turns out not to be true, which it wouldn't with respect to the team uniform IP, and maybe not even, you know, what if the athlete doesn't own the photo that they're purporting to grant? And this is an area you were touching on NFTs. We can go there, but a bit of a wild west where people are minting NFTs of things they absolutely don't own. So just technically in the agreement, there would be rep representations and warranties that say, yes, these, this, these are true. I do have the rights that I'm purporting to grant to you. And if it turns out that I don't, I have to indemnify you. So you want to be very, the athlete definitely wants to be careful that they're not uh, overextending the rights or that they have, because if uh, they didn't own that photo or if they don't own the IP on, you know, on their uniform to, to be able to grant that and this brand gets sued, the brand can come after the athlete for indemnification. And I think it's, you know, it's so common that you'll see in advertising that you've got uh, you know, a named sports athlete as an example that they're not wearing their their team jersey when they're in the advertising piece. Uh, but it must be a, you know, an interesting education piece. And, and Lyle, as you're you know, de delving into the whole NIL with, the, with athletes in the you know, college space, I uh, just really wonder whether they even have the, you know, the knowledge of what they can share and what they can't share. Most of the universities we've partnered with or most of the university policies that we've reviewed do a really great job of outlining the do's and don'ts for student athletes in very clear and concise terms. Um, some schools, you know, that aren't um, well, you know, represented or not as popular in the social, you know, in the media sense, the perception space, are really now having an internal debate about whether student athletes should be allowed to use their logos or not. Obviously, like a power five institution has a brand associated with said logo, but if you're a, 
a mid-major or smaller institution and you have a highly prolific athlete, them using your school marks now with a 2 million followers will only boost the school's position. But it's an interesting debate some schools are undertaking right now about how to handle institutional marks. Um, some schools have implemented review processes saying, hey, what would you like to now use our marks for? Right? Some schools are saying, hey, if it's volunteer hours, if it's charitable events, absolutely we want to support you in those endeavors. But if the athlete now wants to wear, you know, school A's logo and the, that um, Nike company, if they want to do a camp with an Adidas, obviously the school is now a contractual obligation between Nike and Adidas. So they might now say it's a conflict of interest for us and the, the athletes. So it's like, I think as the NIL space continues to evolve, I think you'll reach a consensus of how to handle these. But right now it's like it kind of all one-off interpretation because every use case is so unique. And, and I think the, you know, the extension of the, the use case and people using your marks and being representative of the teams really does lend back to how you're we talking about, or you were just leading into, Susan, about morals clauses, uh, that, you know, there's so many complications where somebody can get themselves into an issue, whether it's a DUI or, you know, just following what's been going on with uh, Kurt Zuma at West Ham. Uh, and, you know, he abused a cat and now all the sponsors are dropping off the team itself. Uh, there's some you know, big issues around that. So what, what's the coaching and inclusion that you look at from uh, the legal perspective? Right. So morals clauses, you know, I've been practicing for many, many years and, you know, we, we always knew they existed. We didn't pay attention to them. And most, you know, recently in the last, let's say 10 years, starting with me too, and then all the cancel culture we have right now, they've become very important areas of negotiation. So that's, they're sometimes called morals clauses, sometimes called morality clauses. It's not about somebody being moral. What they are is basically a, a provision in an agreement that requires a certain level of good behavior of the athlete, which if they don't, uh, you know, there are consequences. So the consequences can be termination. They could affect the money that's paid. Um, there's different consequences. And the important thing about morals clauses to understand is that they're very, very wording specific. There isn't one clause that everybody uses. And the clause can, you know, you know, the things to think about when you draft the clauses, is, is it only going to, uh, like, what behavior, first of all, is covered by it, you know? And sometimes there's, very often you see wording like um, uh, acts that shock, insult, or offend the community. So, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity in trying to figure out what that means. So, you, you know, obviously, if you're the athlete you, and you want the wording to be much more specific about what behavior is considered bad behavior... As opposed, and if you're the brand, you want sort of broader wording that is more generalized and subjective in, you know, in the reasonable discretion of the brand if this shocks the, or offends the community. So that's one thing. Another thing is, does it have to be an act uh, committed by the athlete or is it just can it be done by a third party? And we have a, a quite a big case recently of a hockey player who um, had nude photos of him um, put up on the Internet from from past prior, you know, the photos had been taken prior to his sponsorship agreement and the photos were not posted by him. And on that very fact specific wording specific morals clause that he had, the brand was not entitled to terminate him. First of all, because he didn't, it wasn't his behavior. He didn't post the photos, somebody else did. And also it was behavior that predated the contract. So again, on the wording of that specific clause, it didn't get captured. And um, so you really have to look at the specific wording. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about morals clauses, and it hasn't taken off completely, but I have succeeded in negotiating this in certain cases, is it's not a one-way street. You know, corporations can behave badly too. And so um, more and more we're seeing um, people ask for reverse moral clauses, where it's actually the brand that has to agree to be on its best behavior, and if not, the athlete can walk with consequences. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, more and more as people are becoming socially aware and socially conscious of their own brand, I think as the athletes are developing, I can totally understand where they're coming from that space. And I guess the, the extension in this, these types of clauses and thinking about, you know, Naomi Osaka last year, you know, with, you know, right, rightfully she had some issues around her mental health that she wanted to take care of uh, and she stepped out of competition. Uh, but that affected so many brands and it's just, you know, is there protection for brands or do they really need to look at pivoting in a different direction? 
Well, that's something that, you know, a brand needs to think about very carefully. I mean, legally, you can put into the agreement if they stop performing. And again, outside of the context of the NCAA, but if the athlete stops performing or withdraws, you can say, well, we're not going to pay you. We can terminate you. But you also, and, you know, as a lawyer, I don't just look at the legal and the contract terms. I also step back with my clients and say, okay, well, how is that going to fly publicly? Does it, you know, is, do you want to be the brand that said that because that Naomi Osaka stopped stopping to compete because of taking a mental health break? Do you want to be the brand that, you know, shut down your sponsorship because of that? Nike got into trouble uh, in that respect a few years ago when it wasn't paying female athletes during their maternity leaves and pregnancies when they weren't competing. And uh, there was a lot of flack for that. Peter, do you want to jump in? Yeah, no, I think Susan really said it all. It, you know, it, in many cases, it comes down between the the relationship between um, the athlete, their agent, and the brand. You know, and um, if you know Naomi, Naomi Osaka, I'm sure it had it written. She's going to play in all the majors. She's going to play in um, you know this many tournaments. Um, and if she misses it because of a reason that everybody can kind of live with, and especially if it's a timely um, mental health is a huge issue right now. And she, you know, she's actually doing more for the brand by not playing and taking this stance than actually playing and having a nervous breakdown. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, there's kind of a rule of thumb and it, it like, you know, at Inspire, we, what we try to tell our athletes, we want them to perform on their bikes for sure. That's, that's why that's what they're doing. That's, that's their kind of uh, raison d'etre, if you will. Um, but we asked them to have a sense of purpose around something. So for example, Mike Woods is all about sustainability. And, you know, the bike is a highly sustainable mode of transportation, but the world tour is not. There's like, they're flying all over the place or in team buses. Like it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a kind of pollution pig, if you will. So he really is doing everything he can to offset uh, his carbon footprint. And so stuff like that is great to talk about. Um, where you want it, like, and so you, you, and you, you're not saying your athletes have to be centrist. Um, you want them to have a sense of, okay, this is what I believe in and so on. But just the rule of thumb is you stay away from politics, stay away from religion. Um, and now it's kind of, you, you can't really talk about vaccination and you can't talk about freedom fighters, so to speak. I mean, anything that's just too polarizing that suddenly creates tension between you and a brand. And the question is, do you want that tension with that partnership? Um, at the end of the day, it's at risk if you if you do create that tension and make those decisions um, that are kind of off-center, if you will. Well, I think that just consistent with any sponsorship, if, you, if you're not aligned in messaging between the brand and the property or the athlete, it's going to affect that relationship moving forward and you know potentially affect it negatively. So you know, I'm thinking about a couple other you know implications of athletes getting sponsorship. You know, there's there's government grants that they'll receive. Uh, you know, in the case of you know students, there's their you know education support. You know, while you I know you specifically manage some of those issues and tax implications of people getting these. Uh, you know, getting these endorsement dollars and not really realizing the lengthy input that that could have on them. Uh, you know, what's your insight on it? It's 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 a tricky conversation. Like I said, you know, at eighteen, we were all very naive. Um, to put the you know, some some of us on this call might be a lot more prepared than I was at eighteen. I just, I didn't know that much at eighteen. I didn't understand taxes. I remember my first paycheck at sixteen, and I saw, hey, mom, I'm making ten dollars an hour, and I work thirty hours. This is not three hundred bucks. He's like, those are taxes, Lyle. I was like, oh no, why did no one tell me this going into the conversation? So I think. To help student athletes, especially the masses, you have to, you know, work with them and work with the schools. The school's in a very tricky, precarious position because they can't tell them to save money, right? The, the school has to be a step removed from what they can and cannot do uh, due to the nature of how NIL is. The school cannot help facilitate or give direct advice, right? So they can't say, hey, Susan, go save 50%. So they want to provide enough resources or information or guidance so the student athlete knows that there are consequences for the action. And that's one of the things, unfortunately, I'm very concerned about um, for the first year of NIL. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with how financial aid and Pell Grants work in the States. It's based on your family's income over the last two years. So they make an average and they, then they use that average to allocate funds if you want to get government assistance or a grant 
at a given school, right? Some schools have higher thresholds, some schools have lower thresholds, but for the sake of this analogy, let's say it's $50,000. So if a kid does an NIL opportunity now for 8K and it bumps them now to, instead of having 100 over the last two years, they have 108 now, that averages at 54,000. So in theory, that kid could lose that 10K Pell Grant. Is now that $8,000 NIL opportunity worth that Pell Grant reduction of 10K? Because the 8K is not really 8K. It's probably 5,500 after you pay state and federal tax on it. So yes, 5,500 is a lot of money for a lot of student athletes, but is it now worth that $10,000 of lost tuition money or room and board that they've now sacrificed unwillingly with pursuing this opportunity? So that's what makes NIL very tricky. Like, Having these upfront conversations with student athletes, I think is a very imperative, whether it's from your support staff, uh, your family, your, your agents, your brand managers up front saying, hey, Peter, is this worth the long-term potential implications or just understanding that you're going to have to pay taxes? Um, it's a lot easier to be very frank with you in the professional ranks, right? Because you have agents, you have accountants, you have people who are now monitoring your finances who can give you that guidance and be a bit more... Um, assertive in their communication with like, hey, you need to save this or not do this. But when you're dealing with a 18, 19 year old, the school can't play that role, right? And they might not share with their parents and they could be a dependent. So for me, it's a very, it's an area of worry that I hopefully, like I said, we'll get more visibility into in the next upcoming months, i.e. Uh, April 15th. Uh, and hopefully a lot of student athletes don't have negative impacts. It's not so much the ones who will make six figures, right? If you have a six figure endorsement deal, you'll be fine because you have an agent and you have someone helping you negotiate that deal. So they're aware of the financial implications. It's those athletes who are doing mid to low five digit opportunities or they don't understand it, or even the ones who are doing a lot of in-kind payments. Because Susan knows from a legal standpoint, in-kind is still taxable. It's a, it's a, it's a benefit. So if I now get a $4,000 of swag, I'm going to get a 1099 for that, yet I haven't earned any compensation physical. So that now taxable hit comes out of the student athlete's pocket, many of them who, who might not have that cash reserve to pay the taxes. Yeah, and it gets you know, pretty, pretty complicated on that. And you know, Peter, I know you've dealt with a, a lot of teams, and, and then you've got the athletes who are going independent of their teams in the past. You know, is there team funding and independent funding that comes into conflict as well? Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's literally left up to each individual athlete to manage their, their tax situation, quite honestly. The team doesn't really get involved. Um, it's, and listen, even with our athletes, um, they know that when, when money comes in for a, uh, from a bike partner or, or whomever, um, that um, they're going to get X amount of dollars, but they but they need to save some money for taxes as well. And listen, they are their own entity. Um, most of them are kind of, are are probably um, uh, like small businesses, and uh, themselves will do their taxes accordingly. Be able to have write offs for training and things like that. So hopefully, a lot of those. Um, uh, you know, tax receipts can be mitigated, you know, or, or the, the taxes that they pay will be mitigated by their training and, and, and so on. So, but most of it literally is, is, is up to them. I love Lyle's platform because it really sets them up in advance and says, okay, um, um, you know, here's the good decision-making or bad decision-making opportunity for you. Yeah, and I think, you know, definitely when it comes to the taxes and money, it's, it's always what, what's in your hands and trying to, especially at 18, 19 years old, realizing that it's, it's not all yours or it won't be all yours in the future. Um, now, do you find that athletes are dealing one-on-one -on -one with brands or are they going through a variety of different partnerships or partnership platforms? I've been thinking of the hashtag paid or some of these other influencer spaces and I know there's a, you know, a couple that I've seen pop out of the U.S. Uh, over time and Ball's Life. Um, is, is it a mix or are they dedicated in one direction? I, I, we've seen a mix so far in the first, sorry, Peter. Um, we've seen a mix so far in the first, you know, eight months of NIL. There's been some really great companies who've created NIL marketplaces to help student athletes find deals or work with local vendors or national, you know, merchants. So it's been really great because it's given some of the athletes exposure, but it came back to the point that 
Peter and Susan mentioned earlier, you kind of have to educate the athletes. Because like some of them, if you don't have a substantial amount of following, you're not really appealing to certain brands unless you have a strong standing in that locale. Um, like taking myself, I live in New York City right now. There's tons of opportunity in New York City from sponsorships, but no one knows who I am when I walk down the street. So it's highly unlikely that a big brand's going to want to pay me to be in uh, a marketing collateral now. So you have to educate the athlete there. So these marketplaces kind of allow them to get exposure to a lot of different brands that could align with them. So I think it's wonderful. Um, the high, you know, the high popular athletes or the ones with tons of social followings have people to assist in those endeavors. But I anticipate having more and more marketplaces, you know, developing in their probably next 12 to 18 months. Some of them are having a more specific niche now going forward, whether it's in the NFT space, Web 3.0, you know, consumer product goods, athletic apparel, because right now it's kind of a, a open market. So I can see them becoming a bit more concentrated, but I think they'll exist for, you know, going forward. And Brian's job said, sent me a, sorry, do you want to Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, you, you know, we, uh, there's, there's outbound and inbound, you know, for sponsorship. Um, and so we, as agents, we, we, we speak to our network and, and we talk about some of our athletes and what they can bring to the table um, and try to develop kind of a value proposition around this athlete and that brand to come to an agreement. Um, and then there's inbound where brands say, hey, listen, uh, we love your social feed. We'd love to, we'd love you to be part of our program. Um, we have ambassadors and so on. Um, and, and so those are great. We typically take those from the athletes directly and say, listen, let, let us handle it. Because in many cases, what happens is, listen, it's flattering when somebody says, I want to give you a whole bunch of product or swag or whatever it is. But, you know, in any partnership, whether it's, you know, uh, a big bike deal or a small, you know, uh, you know, a, a smaller deal, let's just say that from an, um, an influencer type deal, um, it takes a lot to um, manage it, to execute it, to put it together, to create, like, to do the, you know, content creation. And so how much time do you really have? You know, is it pulling you away from your training? You know, what, which ones are worth it and which ones are. And so as, as agents, we try to take those away from our athletes and say, okay, listen, these guys just want to give you some swag. We don't think it's worth it. Uh, but these guys are, are, are very serious um, and they want a sponsorship and we, we try to get into the real, the root of what sponsorship is. Like it's, it's, it's not really an exchange of just impressions. That's a media buy, um, which a lot of these influencers do. They've got a great following. They do a media buy. It's, it's that kind of exchange. We're trying to actually inject our, our athletes or properties if we're selling property into the brand story of. Um, of that brand, of that sponsor, so that they become intertwined, that there's an actual relationship that they can coexist. And it's not a one and done. It's not a six month deal. It's a multi-year deal that tells a story over a period of time that is relevant, that provides esteem and has a point of differentiation. And that's literally like, I, I, I um, you know, I think your question was about, was really about, you know, how do athletes go out and get, you know, these partnerships, but, we, you know, there's really the outbound and then there's the inbound and it's just how you treat them both. I think same same as anything else. The you know servicing of a five thousand dollars sponsor is almost equivalent to servicing of a five million dollars sponsor uh, because they've got their specific needs and objectives we've got to walk through. Um, I guess Susan, I said Brian dropped a question into the chat, and I think you know, probably good to address to you is you know are there common questions and concerns you know about working with brands and you know from a contractual standpoint and you know what are people shocked by? Uh, well, you're talking about from the athlete's perspective, the, the athlete or the, or the brand's perspective that just, you know, things that they're not, uh, you know, or I guess questions that they're always getting in terms uh -huh. of, uh, or you're always getting in terms of building those, uh, arrangements together and things that they just haven't thought of before. Well, the main area, and I sort of touch on this as well, building on what Peter said, not only do you want to assess a sponsorship from an athlete's perspective to see if it's going to dominate their time and be worth the free swag. But um, as I mentioned, the exclusivity provisions of these agreements are very, very tricky and you want to be very careful about them because right now it may seem cool to get a little bit of free swag, but if you're bound for years to not do a sponsorship or an endorsement in a related business, and you know that could be defined very broadly, um, that could really tie your hands when you've actually become a more high profile athlete who could garner a bigger endorsement, but then you're blocked. 
So that's one area that I think is um, really important to think about. And um, then the, the other area is also, you know, termination provisions, like what justifies shutting the sponsorship down and what happens to the money and, and the other consequences. Does this non-compete or this exclusivity continue even if the sponsorship is over? So working out the timing and the consequences of the end of the relationship is important as well. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, contracts can always be tricky and just making sure people are aware on both sides. And if there was a, a question that came in the advanced questions uh, ahead of time, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to hear from you, but, you know, are, are contracts required being that, you know, there's a league or there's NCA involved and, you know, and what needs to be in it to cover the brand? Right. So the leagues don't do sponsorship contracts for athletes, um, nor does the NCAA. So, you know, first of all, no brand is going to start using an athlete's NIL, name, image, likeness, or whatever else they're agreeing to let them use without a piece of paper saying that with the representations and warranties and indemnification provisions that I put in. I mean, I would never advise a brand to just take the word of the athlete and do it sort of as a verbal. Um, and it really is up to the athlete. If, it, if they're talking about their own NIL, it's up to them to do the, you know, they need the, the contract themselves. There's no overarching league that's going to do it for them. Um, and I think they should want to do it because, again, this is part of making sure that the exclusivity doesn't bind them too much. Um, if there is any at all, uh, the compensation comes directly to them. They know how long they're in it for or how they can get out. And so, yes, contracts are necessary. You know, I was just going to say on that too, and, and Susan, you kind of touched upon this and some of the language of the contract and like the end of the contract, but also in the renewal of the contract. So um, what you'll what you'll get from um, a lot of brands will actually come at you with last right of refusal, but it's guys as first right of refusal, but it's written as last right of refusal. And I think you have to be very careful with the, a clause like that. Um, brands shouldn't have last right of refusal. You give them first right of refusal. There's a date by which they need to say, we intend to signing this athlete again. Um, they have 30, you know, 30 or 60 days, whatever the number is, um, to negotiate it. And if by that time you can't come to an agreement, then you as an athlete or a property are free and clear to negotiate with someone else after the term finishes. And so it's, it's clean um, you give your sponsor the first right of refusal. When you do last right of refusal, it basically makes you shop around your athlete or your property to a whole bunch of other brands in that category, um, get, their, get their confidence, get their trust, only to go back to them and say, oh, we, can't, uh, we can't do the deal because uh, the, the former sponsor is going to match it. So, um, you know, there's kind of two, two, uh, two, two pieces in there. Um, Renewals are important and have really good language in your contracts for renewals because that'll either extend your contract or terminate the contract uh, and then you're free and clear to go other ways. And the other, the other piece was um, be careful of last right of refusal versus first right of refusal. Peter, that's a really good point. And I, one thing I'd like to drive home is these terms don't mean anything until you look at what, how they play out in the agreement. So if you draft an agreement, you say, okay, I have a last right of refusal or a matching right or a right of first negotiation, exclusive, not exclusive, unless you spell out exactly how that works, it, it doesn't have its own inherent meaning. So uh, as an athlete, if you're granting any of these, you want to know, okay, when you said last right or, or first right of refusal or right to negotiate, do you really mean a matching right at the end of the day? Because the, it's true that that really uh, inhibits your ability, not just your relationship with a new potential sponsor, but your ability to negotiate. Because you're saying, hey, new sponsor, let's negotiate a deal. But by the way, after we negotiate, I may have to not do it with you and do it with somebody else. That'll change the dynamic of the negotiation and what you get. And then you also want to know exactly the timing. Who has to send a notice? How many days do they have? So all those things should be spelled out in the contract and don't just rely on the term right of first negotiation. Like it has to be spelled out. The other thing I want to point out is when we talk about renewals, typically we're talking about options at the option of the sponsor of the brand, right? What that means is it could be a, you know, an initial period of a year and then options for additional years. But typically those are not um, optioned mutually because both parties want to come together. You don't even have to provide that in a contract. If both parties mutually agree to extend the contract, that's an extension. 
what these options say is that you know the the sponsor can extend for a period of time on certain conditions, payment of a certain amount, and you know it's if that's the way the options are structured, it's in my view always better for the athlete not to have a long term meaning lots of options contract because if there's a short term without the ability of the brand to extend, it doesn't mean they're not going to extend. They will if it's if it's a good sponsorship. But it means that you know at the end of the year you're free and clear to go someplace else, subject to matching rights or rights of first negotiation. And I think that probably comes in, even in the same in representation and, and who your management is. And I don't know if it's urban legend or whether it actually happened, but I had heard years ago that uh, Magic Johnson had got to know Michael Jordan while he was still in college and then got representation rights that carried on for a number of years afterward. Uh, so for every dollar that uh, Michael Jordan made, part of it was going to Magic Johnson for how he was being repped. Uh, and I could see that being major, major issues for a lot of, a lot of athletes. Great. And then uh, so a question that I, we got in advance uh, as well, Lyle, was around Canadian athletes and how their approach uh, should be if they're you know, they're, they're at the college level, NCAA, you know, does their NIL change because they're not, you know, Americans? Um, uh, unfortunately, it does right now. Um, if you're an international student, the type of visa you have restricts you from working in the United States while you're on that visa. Um, so for those student athletes who are interested in pursuing NIL opportunities, I would definitely consult your compliance department or your um, student athlete um, affairs department who handles your visa. Um, to make sure that, you know, the, the rules in your given state are such or your visa functions as however. But my, my follow-up statement is that only applies if you're in a United States. If you can see where I'm going with that. If you now go home to Canada or you go home to Toronto or Hamilton or Vancouver in the summer, maybe your student, your, maybe your visa now permits you to now work because you're no longer in the state. So you can now pursue opportunities in your home country, uh, depending on how your visa is constructed in your school's policies. But like I said, better to be safe than sorry is my advice to those student athletes. Have a conversation with your school to make sure that it's permitted. They support it because at the end of the day, I don't want you to now sign something or do an, do an opportunity that could be substantial income for you, but it could jeopardize your bigger education education or your scholarship at said institution. So it's kind of a trickier slope, Brad. Great question. But like I said, I would ask compliance, they'll give you an answer and then proceed from there uh, to make sure that you can stay eligible, and retain that scholarship. And would it, I guess, probably a compliance question, but would it matter where the money's coming from? So if you're, you know, college town and you're getting money from the college town, that's one thing. But if you're, you know, getting sponsored by, say, a, a Canadian brand who's located in your hometown, does that make a difference? <sighs> Refer to Susan because I am not a lawyer, but what my legal mind would tell me here is it depends on where the opportunity now is uh, fulfilled or where you now do the objective or the commitment. Because I know for professional athletes, uh, whether it's hockey players or you know NFL or soccer players, they get 1099 from each state that they play a game in, right? So like I might be a New York Rangers hockey player, but if I play a game in California, California is going to give me a 1099 at the end of the year for the games played in the state of California. So I think if that is true for professionals, I think the locale of where you completed the you know assignment or the activity or you you know you shot the photo shoot would now play a role in like you know the jurisdiction and the governing laws is my interpretation of it. Like so, like, I will defer to the lot smarter legal minds on this call to provide guidance there. I am so not going to touch that. That is those are complicated immigration and tax questions way beyond my area of expertise. Same. So maybe there's a line of business coming to you now. I should say I do have colleagues who can answer those questions, though, okay. if anybody really needs to know the answers. And, and the one piece we haven't touched on throughout the conversation is, is evaluation. You know, and, and Peter, maybe you've got a, a great perspective on it. It's just how, how are you reporting back to, to brands on uh, the impact they've had? You know, it's it's a it's a good question. It's it's interesting. Um, I find a real big difference between um, reporting back with athletes versus properties. Where with a property, there's a full valuation that needs to be done. 
Um, you know, whether it's everything from total impressions to, um, you know, what happened experientially and, and so on and so on. Um, I, I, I've been finding that essentially getting back to your sponsors make, it's like a checklist that they do this many Instagram posts. And, and quite honestly, the, you know, the relationship uh, with athletes, you know, they're, they're talking not daily, but quite regularly. Uh, they're bringing them in for photo shoots and, and marketing campaigns and things like that. So there's a high level of discussion going on. And so um, I'll give you an example. Mike Woods, he's a pro tour rider. He came fifth at the Olympics. He's living in Girona. He's in the world tour. Um, we did a partnership with him at Aura Ring. And a big part of that partnership was um, there are a series of posts over the course of the year. And then there's a campaign that they actually went over, shot. He put it on his, his social channels. Um, they did as well. And, you know, they were very satisfied with that relationship and that partnership. And it was really compact. Everything was kind of checked off the list. There was no need for us to do a full valuation on it, this many impressions and so on. I find that it's the upfront stuff is when you're selling, you're basically selling, you know, this is the athlete, this is their reach, um, this is their, you know, cost per thousand type of thing. Um, and a lot of that's done up front uh, on the athlete side. Susan, I know you, you work in the entertainment and sports space. And, and do you find that it's, it's very similar in the types of uh, reports and activities that brands want to see? Or is, are there differences because, you know, it's a different uh, you know, ball game, for lack of a better word? Uh, you know, when we're talking about endorsement agreements and sponsorship agreements, the, the, they do look the same. The services that are rendered may be different. If you're talking about a musician, obviously they're going to want, you know, the musician maybe to perform, uh, whether it's, you know, for a commercial or for a, an in-house event. So, you know, there's different things or there's different elements or services that people render, but basically the structure of the contracts are the same. It's the, they will have morals clauses. They will have exclusivity. There will be a, you know, a big section about what, exactly what the, the celebrity or athlete or musician or entertainer has to do. Um, there'll be a grant of rights in the, in the, in this, the athlete or the entertainer's IP. So it'll, it'll follow the same format. It's just the, the details of what they're actually going to be doing as the services of the sponsorship may differ slightly given what they know how to do. Perfect. And one last question before we wrap up, you know, are, are there certain brands that, that do better uh, and would you know, benefit more from being in an athlete versus uh, team or league space? Not sure who wants to jump in on that. You know, I, I, I'll just a quick, listen, I think a great, a perfect partnership is you've got a team, an event and an athlete, you know, it's a, kind of a three cornered hat. Could be a could be a league team athlete type of thing, um, but you've got you know so you've got you blocked your category with the team, um, you've got a spokesperson with the athlete, and it comes to life at the event type of thing, and so I I'd like to see those types of things happening. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, I think if you're trying to reach a specific segment of the population, and I'll just get I'm not I'm not. Um, you know, I'm not coming down on pro sports or the Blue Jays, but when you buy the Blue Jays, for example, you're buying corporate boxes and you're buying family groups and you're buying um, moms and dads and, and, and church groups. And like, you're literally buying all these different segments. And if you're really just, you know, if you've got finite dollars, um, then I would focus on an athlete that, that resonates with that market segment. Uh, it's less expensive. You get a spokesperson. Um, if you've got a great campaign, they can make it come alive. So it really depends on if you're good to get the mass or if you really want market segmentation. Fantastic. Lyle or Susan, anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered today? I would just say thank you in conclusion. It's been really nice to you know hear Susan and Peter's thoughts today. Brad, thank you for organizing. Um, everyone in the audience, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to attend. Um, for me from the NIL and the collegiate ranks, or included spaces, it's, we're only eight months in and we've learned so much. Um, what December of 2022 will look like or March of 2023 is, like, I don't know. But one thing I do know is student athletes are feeling more comfortable with, you know, monetizing from name, image, and likeness. And like, they'll continue to like now take advantage of this moving forward. So I'm excited for the future, right? Like, 
looking at some of our institutions, everyone thought it was football, women's basketball, men's basketball. One school has 30 of their 40 sports who now benefited from name and image likeness so far, which is super exciting to me because it's now the Olympic sports. It's the non-popular sports in the eyes of the media that are benefiting from that. And that's the most exciting thing. So I'm excited to see how this space continues to move forward. Yeah, thank you for having me as well. I'm excited too, because it means there's a whole new range of clients who might need our services to help advise them. Perfect. And I'll say thanks as well too to Brad and Susan and Lyle and everybody that joined us today. It was really uh, enjoyable to speak with everybody. Learned a lot. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Thank, thank you, uh, Peter, Susan, and Lyle. Fantastic to have your insight. Uh, for everyone on the call, uh, if you want to connect with uh, with any of us, uh, I'll send out an email. And there'll be opportunity to connect with people on LinkedIn and if. Susan and Lyle and Peter are comfortable with their email address being shared. I'll include that as well, along with a, a link to the recording of this session. Uh, and then we'll have our upcoming sessions of good information on that. Uh, one will be focused on purpose sponsorship, one on music and music festivals, and then the other on sponsorship and upcoming brands, up, up and coming brands. So looking forward to having you join for that. And again, thank you for your time today. Fantastic as always. Bye guys. Cheers.